Hello. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. I'm Conor Justin. And I'm Igor Pushkaric. And here we are here to tell you about limitations of real-time 3D art, how to overcome them, how to solve them, optimize for them, and maybe, who knows, maybe improve your art with them. First, a little bit about us. I'm a musician and 3D artist with traditional art background. So if you see me with a sketchbook like a lunatic, then no, it's normal. Here's my succulent Fifi. You guys gave it to me at last year's conference. And as you can see, it's doing quite well, despite the fact that I dropped it once or twice. And on the right, you see me in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with a rabbit peko. That, of course, happens in a traditional Swedish homestead. And I've been doing 3D art for 11 years now, and using Blender to do it for four, since the legendary 2.8 release. And here you can see examples of my work, some colorful dioramas, uh, asset packs, game environments, and recently, a movie. What about you, Igor? Basically, I've been an artist my whole life, doing 3D for only 15 years. And some best kind of fact about me is that I like ideas. I like to merge uh, different things that are perhaps not mergeable and create something new. For this, I use tools of drawing, tools of uh, animation, and tools of 3D modeling. And, and they combine each other and inspire each other. Uh, in terms of software, first I, first I used uh, 3D, soft, uh, 3D uh, Max, and then I s also taught uh, ZBrush, and then lately I tried uh, Blender, and I so far never looked back. Um, for, for a while, over the years, I have been um, growing, growing in terms of public presence. I won some awards, got featured by some, by some big and smaller name uh, companies, uh, worked with some really awesome people, had some cool blogs and podcasts. Uh, lately, I now I have permission, permission to say it, I uh, had the honor of uh, participating in creating a curriculum for the uh, Croatia's uh, school system. Uh, however, I also work as a uh, Blender teacher in Novska uh, Pismo, which is uh, basically understood as a Croatian uh, gaming center. I'm also a Sketchfab seller and a master just like Konrad. Uh, my utmost <laughs> excitement happened when my model worker 12 became a, a head model on the Sketchfab's main page. All right, when you create a 3D scene for real-time uh, uh, usage, like uh, video games, AR, uh, on the web, uh, you face hardware and software limitations. Those could be GPU not being able to render high-res textures or too many polygons, or your game engine not supporting soft body physics or dynamic lighting. And we all use uh, workarounds, optimizations, illusions, and tricks to get around these limitations. Now, imagine that you have a very beefy PC, very strong PC, and very powerful game engine, so you have no limitations whatsoever. You might want to still take these detours because they are interesting to explore, and they determine new art styles. And we're going to need example, and together with Igor, we have created a movie. But not just any movie. It is an interactive, uh, short, 3D movie on the web in a browser. We published it on Sketchfab, and you can find it on my Sketchfab profile if you're interested. And in there, you can zoom in, pan around, orbit, and inspect the scene as the movie plays out. You can check out what are, what are the PBR maps, what you can check what is the topology, and everything like that. Um, there is a whole article how the movie was made, so if you're interested, you can check it out on sketchfab.com slash blog. And uh, you can see the movie itself on my Sketchfab profile. Maybe, maybe not now, okay? Um, so what are those limitations that we want to talk about today? So since Sketchfab was not originally meant to do what we were intended to do, we had to face some uh, basically low poly budgets, lighting, uh, low texture budget, and uh, animation restrictions. Yeah, those are all limitations we have to face. Starting with low poly yeah. budget. So when you create art for 3D real-time graphics, uh, best way to optimize 
uh, hats off is using LODs. LODs are lower resolution models that replace original mesh as you get further and further away from it. And this is LOD0, the highest resolution, LOD1, LOD2, LOD3, and so on. Some engines, like Unreal, are going to generate those LODs for you, but most not. So it's good to know how to create them. You can do that by decimating loop cuts in Blender or by decimating topology using the modifier. Just don't decimate it too much. <laughs> uh, for our project, we didn't have LODs. So, and the, top, and the budget is very low. It's on the web. So it's only 500,000 triangles for mobile and 2 million triangles for average gaming PC. <laughs> Somehow we managed to keep, this is the final scene of the project. And it has only 180,000 uh, triangles. So how did we do it? A first step and the most important is creating blockout. Blockout is a simplified geometry without any details, no textures. And you can see iterations of it. And this one is being the final. The blue line, let's call it a focal line, represents the path that robot protagonists, heroes of the movie, take. And this blue line represents, um, it, it affects blockout as well as blockout affects it. But more, what is more important is this blue line determines objects and their distribution and the distribution of detail in the scene. Within the blockout, there are so-called placeholders. And one of them, some kind of a pipe system, we separate and finish it, have a proper topology, fully fledged model. And this becomes an example, a template of a sort for every other model in the, in the project. But not every model is going to have the same density of topology. Something that is close to the focal line is going to be higher resolution, and the objects further away are going to need only enough to keep their form and to have a good silhouette against the background. That creates a distribution of topology. This image uh, showcases exactly what Conrad was saying right now. Uh, high poly, mid poly, and low poly are the divisions. So we gave our robots the highest poly since they are the main attraction in terms of action and moving. Then we have the mid poly, which is the near approximate environment. And the green represents low poly, things out of the main focus, just sort of to fulfill the scene, but to be there. Mm -hmm. To summarize this chapter, um, best way to optimize is using LODs. If you can't do that, create a blockout. Then within the blockout have placeholders, and one of them, maybe you can turn into some kind of a template model, which serves as an example, a system of topology for your project. And last but not least is having a proper smart topology distribution, dense where it matters, and scarce where it's far from the focal line. And some artists who embrace the limitation of low poly art kept on lowering and lowering and lowering the topology. And, it, and they figured out that we don't need millions of them to create something that is appealing and beautiful. Thank you, PolyPerfect. Next chapter, light limitations. In uh, real-time 3D graphics, light calculations are heavy. So this is why we bake them, we bake lighting. Uh, bake light is not physically in the scene, but the data from it is. So this could be both volumetric data and flat. And volumetric one is captured by so-called light probes. This is screenshot from Unreal. And those light probes are responsible for illuminating objects that move, like, like the player for the environment. And then we have a flat data. This is screenshot from Unity. And this shows light maps. This is, uh, they are used to illuminate objects that are static. And this is being saved to a second UV channel. In our project, we have both moving objects and static, but we have no light maps nor light probes. So what did we do? Take a look. This is final version of the Blender scene. In here, we had 44 light sources and extra shadow casting planes to darken some areas of that cave over there and the bottom of the pit. Now on SketchUp, however, this is how the final, ver uh, final uh, scene looks like. As you see, all the lights have ind indirect lighting contribution. Light scatters all over the place. In, in the final scene, on SketchUp, we only are limited to three light sources and HDRI, and we have no invisible shadow casters, as well as none of these light sources actually contribute indirect lighting paths. So how do we transfer all that lighting data from SketchUp, from Blender to SketchUp? We do it by baking light into textures. This is how one of these textures with light baked in looks like. It's not just any light, it's indirect light, and you can do it in Blender by using Cycles Combined Bake, just make sure to uncheck the direct lighting option. This bake looks pretty, but it's quite dark. And 
the secret ingredient of this method that doesn't use light maps or light probes is to input this thing into a missive slot on Sketchfab on the web. So one, two, three, those are directional light sources that are responsible for dynamic shadows in Sketchfab. Everything else, all of these 44 light sources, all of these invisible shadow casters, all that indirect lighting contribution is done by emitting light through textures. So we have a problem because if our character, our hero, hero is in light, it's all good. He can read a book. But when he gets to the shadow, he becomes completely dark. Now, for moving objects, we also need to use emissive input. So it is good to find a balance in this workflow. To have, if you have too strong emission for objects that move, uh, they're going to look too, too, too bright in areas that are lit. However, if you have too weak emission, they're going to be too dark in shadows. There's another uh, lighting limitation that we stumbled upon when working on the, on the movie. And that is, uh, we have dynamic shadows, but we are not allowed to move light. How to go around with it? Uh, our friend from Ireland, Tycho, he experimented with this stuff, and he came up with a bunch of nice solutions that we want to present to you. The first one is, if, uh, if Mohammed cannot get to mountain, maybe the mountain can get to Mohammed. So light can't move. Let's move the environment instead. <laughs> Here, we attach three spotlights to this light orb, and it is static. Environment moves. Don't ask me why spotlights. Uh, it could be a point light, but for some reason, it doesn't cast shadows. But we wanted shadows. And if the camera stays close, the illusion just works. What if you have a multiple light sources that move independently from one another? You can no longer use the environment moving because it moves only in one vector. So for that, uh, you can do add a strong emission to the sphere, then in post-processing and bloom. Now it appears as the sphere is actually emitting light. We are using illusions, tricks. But unfortunately, the light is not actually illuminating surfaces around it, unless we put a fake sphere behind the rock and add a very strong bloom to it, make it bigger, and make it um, mirror the movement of the sphere that is visible. Now, if we add a translucent, um, a refractive tra translucency to the surface of the rock, we have that bloom of the hidden sphere scatter through, and it, this creates illusion of light illuminating surface of the object. Speaking of illusions, there is also a uh, third way. This way, we have a spotlight that casts a shadow. However, even though we cannot control the light itself, we can control the condition, conditions uh, the light passes through. So this, we get this plane. We can animate it through blend shapes or through object-based animation or through texture-based uh, uh, shape that just alpha keys, basically. And we, we can also um, control it through the any underlying geometry, such as this fan. And then it casts such shadow that we produced on the surface below. We mentioned those limitations because um, discoveries, w while exploring solutions to these problems, um, they determine identity of your style. They can determine identity of your style. Thank you, Taiko, for your lessons. To summarize this chapter, have your key lights, the main, most important lights, real time, and bake everything else into light maps, light probes, or if you can't have those, use emission. But just remember, if you use emission, you can only add lighting. You cannot make things darker. Keep it in mind, if you, if you have bright scene, it's not going to have any effect. You can bake emissive. Uh, indirect lighting in Blender. You can do it with cycles, combined bake. And you, you, when you use this technique, you find the balance between receiving light, the PBR, and re producing light, the emission setup. Uh, if light can't move, move the environment instead. Uh, use the emission and bloom in post-processing and refractive translucency to, il to create illusion of illumination upon the surface. And animate the shadow casters. Next chapter, textures. Textures are among, among uh, the most demanding uh, things in uh, CGI, both with their size and their uh, amount. So what do what we do? We do that by putting them in a, in, a, sorry, in a square space based on power of 2. So 1K, 10K, doesn't matter. As long as it can produce MIP maps, which is a similar uh, optimization that LODs do with 3D models, meaning that they recalculate based on camera distance. Uh, you can also tile textures. This means that they um, 
transition into repetitions of themselves. They can tile horizontally, vertically, or both ways. This allows you not to create extra texture every time you run out of the UV space. You can also create one texture that's valid enough to create multiple models or parts of models which you can practically create infinitely after having that one texture. And last but not least, you can pack textures into atlases. This is one of the, this is atlas, and they're being rendered in one go, just one draw call. On the right, you see the Unity art engine forcing us, as artists, to shove individual maps into separate channels of RGBA texture. This is also a form of optimization, but damn, it looks ugly. I mean, you can't tell what the hell is going on here unless you open it in Photoshop or GIMP and inspect each channel individually. What a mess. For Spark and BB, for the movie, we were uh, restricted to a square of dimensions 12K on 12K. That relates to nine 4K textures. And somehow we managed to fit within. How did we do it? The first important step is to group geometry into materials. This could be rock, metal, sand. Uh, by the resolution of the object, by whether the object is moving or is it static, by whether what is the position of the object in the scene, how, how it's being lit, or by their purpose. And here's the example. Me and Igor made an asset pack. Um, and here you see how they are divided. So material, rock, rope, metal, and then within the metal part, what is their purpose? Structural, metal sheets, metal pipes, uh, decorative. In the movie, we divide based on position in the scene and lighting. This is because how we bake light into textures. This just makes it easier for us to work like that. And then we have renders, very basic renders, and paintovers. I do those paintovers in Krita and in Blender. So here's one, here's another. And based on those paintovers, I know exactly what texel density, what is the resolution of the texture that I need. So you might see that this um, giant rock, uh, the, the face of the giant, it might seem important, but it actually is in a shadow. So it doesn't require as much uh, texture resolution. And thus, its UV islands can be scaled down, leaving more room for UV islands of the engine or the hand. Now, these uh, paintovers are used to create diffuse textures. And based on diffuse, we make all other maps, such as metallic, roughness, specularity, and so on. Last step is to convert them into JPEGs and make them smaller, some of them, so they, they all can be shoved into this square. To summarize this, keep your textures in a power of two so that mid maps can be generated. Um, tile your textures horizontally, vertically, both ways. Reuse textures, just like Iggy did with his uh, drone pack. Use atlases and use separate channels of RGB texture, if you want. Now, it's probably good to know the budget of your uh, engine. And uh, when you finish modeling, group everything so that you don't have 400 textures for when you have 400 models. That would be just crazy. Uh, figure out the texture distribution. We did it with paintovers. You can do it with uh, just thinking what is important in your scene, what is close to the focal path that's going to be higher texture, texture, texel density. And last step is to generate all needed maps and pack them into the, uh, topo uh, the texture budget. And by embracing this limitation, as well as the previous one, the low poly, uh, a beautiful art can be created. Windmill by Waki on Sketchfab. Here's the prime example of the voxel art. Every single voxel cube is just one color. Sveicht on Reddit. And here's one more. This one uses a very simple gradient of value and color and to project onto very basic topology and creates appealing and beautiful results. Last chapter, animation restrictions. As such, Blender does not have restrictions, <laughs> but there are morphs, there are, uh, there's are armature, there's soft body mechanics, there's hard surface, uh, particle sim, arm object transforms. However, not the point. Point is what we needed in this project is only uh, what we what we needed be, uh, what we didn't compared what we had was limiting meaning we had constrictions mm -hmm. we only had the object transforms and we had arm armature and we had morphs luckily, so what do we do yeah luckily it, it turns out that every animation that we don't have can be somehow done with the one we have and this means that rigid body simulation can be done with simple object transforms keyframing those 
uh, particle simulation like uh, can be done also with keyframing individual instances of particle objects. Soft body like a rope swinging on the wind can be done with simple armature rig and light, light turning on and off. We don't have dynamic light, but we can fake it with using shape keys. For the rigid body, you can simulate it in Blender. Then you have to bake it right into cache. Then you have to bake it again into keyframes. And those, this is how these keyframes looks li look like. You have to optimize them further by decimating them. It's a bit messy. You can skip that limitation completely by manually animating uh, objects falling down. And for this, motion paths turn uh, to be very, very useful. So they, they show you trajectory. As long as it looks like a parable, and is, you know, we know that it's relatively um, believable, but we can do whatever we want. We have full control. Basically, it's all about simple tricks. For example, we need lights turning on and off, which we cannot have, obviously. However, we approach that trick with uh, having two plates. One, one is not emissive, one is emissive. So we just animated the emissive one in front of the non-emissive one, which gave the, uh, the effect of his eyes turning on. Show us the ropes. All right, I'll show you the ropes. <laughs> 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 so in the project, we have a rope that is anchored on both ends. Now, its, its middle swings gently on light Martian breeze. This is normally done. Well, it's not normally done because we don't have uh, ropes on Mars. But if we had, we would use uh, cloth simulation, right? Or soft body physics to achieve that effect. Instead, we can have two chains of bones that meet in the middle in a control point. And then we just simply animate the control point in an elliptic pattern, adding extra swaying motion. And that gives us a believable motion of rope swinging. In summary, when an engine doesn't have all bells and whistles, you, there's always some that it does have, and you can transform in a way for it to seem as though they had all of them. Mm -hmm. You can uh, simulate things, like simulate uh, soft body physics or rigid bodies, but it it's a long, lengthy process, and you, y and you can skip it entirely by ma doing this manually. Uh, by, and that, and we, when you do it, you have great help from motion, uh, motion paths, or you can use, for example, bones for, uh, for the rope, uh, rope simulation. All right, last notes. Um, all these things in the bag, the um, topology restriction, textile, uh, texture uh, this, uh, restriction, lighting and animation limitations, they determine a unique feel of real-time 3D graphics, a feel that we learn to recognize and love. And so even in the future, with technological limitations gone, we might still want to choose to limit ourselves. There are not so many things in this bug, just a couple. But amount of solutions and workarounds and optimizations are infinite, and they're yours to take, and they determine your art style, just like they determined art style in our project. And hopefully after this short presentation, you see how these everyday limitations affect your art, and who knows? Maybe this uh, realization can help you build upon your artistic expression. Thank you. <laughs>